I'm Joshua Cooper, and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, in Moana Nui Akea. Today, we're looking at securing a standard of living and rights for all, Article 25, well-being around the world. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides the power of ideas to initiate change in the world, and the UDHR outlines opportunities for a new direction rooted in inherent dignity and inalienable rights for dynamic, sustainable development and social democracy. Article 25 is the core of economic, social, and cultural rights in the UDHR. And Article 25 really calls on each country to realize the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of oneself and one's family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or the lack of livelihood and circumstances beyond one's control. Today, we're joined by two human rights heroes sharing their examples of engagement to really make sure that Article 25 is a reality and not just a promise on paper. Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Can you share with us a bit of why this issue is so important in international human rights law? So, Josh, thanks for having me. Um, I, I think it's kind of personal. I, um, I didn't learn about this document until I became a community organizer, and I entered community organizing from a lived experience, formerly homeless having spent two and a half years on the streets of Miami and 10 months in a New York City homeless shelter. And that process transformed me. And as I started to do some research, understanding why people ended up homeless, why people were struggling for the right to housing, I came across this document. And the document became sort of a, a religious instrument for me, sort of a way of saying, okay, if this country that I lived in helped create this document, um, then why don't they teach it in schools? It always struck me as sort of strange that it wasn't taught in our schools, and I had to learn it by, almost by accident. That's a great point. Eric, can you share a bit why you think this issue is so important in international human rights law, and what first inspired you to care about this issue? Sure. Um, so. I mean, the, the core promise of the human rights system is that it enables people to live full lives with uh, their full inherent human dignity. And uh, here in the U.S., we often think primarily as rights about the, the civil and political rights that we're more familiar with, the right to vote, uh, right to fair trial, um, uh, you know, those sorts of things. But what the human rights system says is you can't really fully enjoy those rights unless you have your basic needs met, your uh, adequate housing, um, food, clothing, uh, you know, enough that you can uh, sustain yourself in a healthy and dignified manner. And so that's, uh, that's what the promise of Article 25 is, is it says that those things that are your basic human needs are in fact your basic human rights as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, Martin Luther King is famous for saying, you know, what good is the right to sit at the lunch counter if you can't afford the burger? Um, or, you know, uh, how can you fully enjoy your right to vote if, you don't have a home and don't have, uh, you know, a permanent address and, and aren't sure where you can go to vote or are afraid to leave your belongings behind for the, you know, time that you have to stand in line and, and go to the vote, the polls. So if you don't have those pieces of the right, um, then you're not enjoying your full civil rights and you're not enjoying your full human rights. So all the rights are interconnected and interdependent. Um, and I think that's uh, one of the, the, that is the core principle of the universal human rights system. Um, and the, the reason that I'm interested in all this is because uh, my father uh, grew up uh, in the wake of World War II, during World War II, and in the wake of World War II in, in refugee camps uh, across Europe, uh, came to the U.S. when he was about seven. Um, but for me, I have always just felt that I wouldn't want anything less for others than I would have wanted for, for my own father. And here in the U.S., we see 
our friends and neighbors living in conditions that even my father living in refugee camp uh, didn't have to, to go through. He, he knew that his basic needs for, for shelter over his head, some basic nutrition um, would be met. And, and we aren't ensuring that uh, even to our fellow neighbors. And so that's what kind of has always pushed me in this work is I wouldn't want anything less for anyone than I would have wanted to see done for my own father. Thank you so much, Eric. And Rob, you were describing that this document was crafted. It was Eleanor Roosevelt as chair of the Commission on Human Rights that this document should be known by everyone. And maybe you could share a bit what actions you are involved with to actualize Article 25. And some are the champions that you know that really do put their lives on the line to make sure that this right is a reality. So I think Eric brought up a good point that I can relate to, right? If you don't have a dignified, affordable, clean place to call home, your life is in peril. And you can't organize, as I call myself an organized now, for better conditions, unless you have a secure home. And I think part of the issue here is we have, you know, Eric mentioned civil rights, and I sort of put the two against one another civil rights versus human rights. So I think our civil law is based on a constitution that was written 250 years ago. And that's kind of problematic to me. It was written to support the ideology of a small group of people rather than a vast network. I always challenge that opening line to our constitution, we the people. And now I start to ask, who were those people? Because if if a person of color like myself was three-fifths of a man, I wasn't included in that. So I saw it problematic from the beginning. But then going through this document, it gave me hope. It saw that, you know, outside of the U.S., there was practice, right? People are practicing in the international concept. And international law, in my opinion, supersedes our civil law, right? If the West, rest of the world can abide by this document and live based on this document, why can't we? So I've seen I've seen people now, and over the last 10, 15 years as I've been organized, I think when people spoke in particular of housing, housing is a human right, it was somewhat of a slogan in the beginning. But I think there's been a shift over the last 10 years that people are feeling it means something. And I think, you know, from where I sit in New York, I, that language is used heavily as people started fighting for the right to representation in housing court, which is a civil court action in New York, right? And they would talk about housing as a human right. And that goes right against our constitution or our state constitution and then whatever laws we have in place in New York City. When you say, okay, so if this is, if this is the way you plan it, if, if housing isn't a human right, but people are coming in here and saying it is, and that challenges judges to go on record as saying it's not. And I always believe that there's not a judge in this country that is going to go on record saying housing isn't, a, or at least be the first to go on record saying housing isn't a human right, right? So it's incumbent upon us to organize our communities to push up from the ground, to say it and challenge those positions. So I've seen the Right to Counsel Coalition do this good work. I've seen individual tenant organizing groups in New York, um, and there are other groups around the country um, that are starting to pick up um, this work and understanding what human rights is and how we could use human rights instruments and, and use opportunities in Geneva to challenge uh, our civil law in the U.S. Thanks so much, Robin. Eric, can you share a bit about what actions you're involved with to actualize the article and some of the champions you consider around this important article? Sure. So, um, you know, while the, the right itself is uh, really intersectional, talking about health, housing, food, uh, et cetera, social security, disability, um, my focus is specifically on, on the, the right to housing, and I don't want to lose the, the, um, the fact that, it's, uh, that it is more comprehensive. Um, and there are lots of heroes working on lots of aspects of, of the right around universal uh, right to health care and, and things like that. 
um, but specifically uh, uh, around the, the human right to housing, as Rob said, this is something that was kind of viewed as more of a slogan, more aspirational, um, you know, and for many years, uh, it's felt like banging my head against the brick wall, trying to say, no, this is actual a, a, a right with legal content, and, and we can use it as part of our organizing, we can use it in our, our uh, court cases. Um, but uh, in the past few years, uh, we really have seen uh, that a lot of the base building work that folks like Rob um, and others have been doing is sinking in. And, uh, you know, as, as they say in New York City, the rent is too damn high. And, and people are coming and saying, well, I need to live somewhere. That's, that should be a right for me. They, they understand it inherently. Um, and so uh, the work has really taken off in the, the last um, presidential election. Uh, we saw that seven of the Democratic candidates uh, came out and said they believe that housing is a right, uh, and some said housing is a human right. Uh, president Biden was the first president, quite possibly since uh, uh, FDR, to, to come into office on a platform that housing should be a right for every American. And uh, this language is getting picked up in Congress as well. Um, Representative Kramala Jayapal has introduced a bill since every year since uh, 2020, uh, the Housing is a Human Right Act. Um, uh, other members of the squad, uh, AOC, um, Cori Bush, uh, um, Ilan Omar, um, they're all talking on the floor of the House about housing as a human right. Um, so the language is really resonating. And they, as I said, they're introducing legislation um, for it. Cori Bush was out on the steps of the Capitol building you know, protesting during the, the middle of the pandemic to extend the eviction moratorium under a big banner that said housing is a human right. Um, and so they are taking that promise, that rhetorical promise of uh, the human right to housing, and they're putting it into legislative bills, into executive actions. And that's, that's really the kind of thing that we want to see. This housing is a human right doesn't mean some foreign uh, international law being imposed upon the U.S., but it's really that we are living up to our own values uh, and putting into our own domestic law what this looks like. And so right now we're also working with uh, folks out in California um, as part of the Housing as a Human Right DA.org effort um, uh, to pass ACA 10, a, a, an amendment to the California Constitution that would actually recognize the human right to housing in California state constitutional law. Um, and then it would be sort of the baseline for uh, policy discussions there for um, for litigation. It doesn't dictate any specific thing, um, any specific practice uh, on its own, but it says the policies that you put in place, the way we interpret our laws, have to push towards that end, that housing is a human right. It's got the same weight uh, as other constitutional rights. And so this is really the, the way forward is to take these international standards and bring them into our domestic law, our domestic practice, our domestic policy, and, um, and make it real for people. Thank you. And truly, the two of you are definitely coming up with the, the boldest, but also the most brilliant strategies of how to use the global and bring it on the grassroots. Rob, could you share with us a bit some of the first things you did? I remember around before the Universal Periodic Review, hosting a special rapporteur visit, organizing different aspects, bringing in other rapporteurs. And could you share a bit of why those UN Human Rights Council special procedures are a valuable tool, how you've utilized them, and how you've been able to actualize Article 25 through those exciting sure. uh, mechanisms to build our national human rights movement? Absolutely. And thank you for you know bringing up um, some of that past work, which was very rewarding. Um, I serve now as a special advisor for a human rights organization called Partners for Dignity and Rights, uh, which was back in the day called NESRI, the National Economic and Social Rights Initiative. And in October 2009, uh, we had an official mission to the U.S. of a U.N. special rapporteur on the right to adequate housing. Um, this position is considered, um, people who hold this position are considered an expert on housing issues across the globe. 
And we had Raquel Romick, who was from Brazil, come to the US. Um, Eric was involved in that visit also. Our two organizations collaborated together um, to uh, put together that mission. Uh, Nesri at the time worked on the civil society portion and the law center worked on the uh, elected and appointed officials side of organizing that visit. And I think it was very powerful because for the people in the different communities, the seven communities that were visited, um, you heard through town hall meetings, comments like, wow, this person came from Brazil to listen to us, to understand our housing conditions when our own representatives wouldn't listen, wouldn't do anything about it. And now this woman comes from Brazil and she's listening to us. I think that was very powerful for the people. Um, we put together a documentary film we had handed out back in the day. It was a, a thing called a flip camera, which we distributed amongst the different groups to record the visit. And from all the footage, we created a documentary called More Than a Roof that I still use in my organizing because there were some powerful statements made in um, made from that visit, including when Raquel Rowling visited Ocala Lakata Sioux in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, where she said housing is more than a roof, right? You know, so a city like mine in New York, where we build a you know an incredible number of shelters and think we've solved the problem. Well, it's more than a roof, right? It's more than a roof over your head. It's a sense of community. It's all these other things. And as Eric was saying earlier, you know, it's a sense of health care, food security. All these things are part of access to clean water, potable water, right? These are all part of these economic, cultural, and social rights. So it was, it was important having that rapporteur visit. Um, we stayed connected with UN special rapporteurs. Uh, including the current, who was Balakrishnan and Raja Gopal. And prior to Raja Gopal was um, Leilani Farhar, who still seems to collaborate a lot with communities on the ground and understands the importance of having, you know, this, the movement come from the people directly impacted by these issues. So I think there are opportunities there, but I also don't want to underestimate the opportunity uh, to go to Geneva and argue on behalf of treaty bodies, those opportunities where some of these rights are entrenched in some of these uh, treaty bodies. And, you know, things like ICERD, ICCPR, I, I shouldn't give the acronyms, I'll say the Committee on Ethnic and Racial Discrimination and the, um, the Committee on Civil and Political Rights, I think also entrenches some of these standards in them and the right to housing is entrenched in both of them. So those are opportunities to bring communities to Geneva to argue this point before the Human Rights Council in Geneva and then put pressure on the United States to say, you need to open up, you need to change, and you need to, you need to submit to these laws like the rest of the world is doing, right? There's no reason why you should take an exceptionalist attitude, U.S., just because you feel your your constitution is this gold standard. It's not necessarily that. And here are the voices telling you that. No, really good point. He said, one of the other beautiful strategies, I think if Eric can share a bit, he's utilized the Universal Periodic Review, the three treaties that we have ratified of the 10, and made sure that they overlap to make sure that he could get that language and bring the global recommendations down to the grassroots and on the ground. Eric, can you share a bit of what you've done with the treaty bodies as well as with the UPR to actualize this Article 25? Sure. Um, so, you know, first it was kind of a matter of, of backing up and saying, where are we now in the U.S. and how are we going to get there? And uh, you know, we don't recognize the right to housing currently in, in, the, um, in domestic law. And so we said, let's start with something that's a little more familiar to people. The right to cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment in our Constitution. Uh, there was a, a court case um, down in Miami, uh, Pottinger versus Miami, that said that if you're punishing somebody for sleeping and sheltering outside and they don't have any alternative place to be, then that's cruel and unusual punishment. And this 
standard had, you know, kind of existed in domestic law, but it wasn't widely applied um, and uh, it needed some reinforcement. And so we said, let's go uh, use some of these international mechanisms. There's a standard that's very parallel to that domestic standard of cruel and unusual. It's cruel and human and degrading treatment at the international level. And let's build that up. Let's build up some language there that can, um, that is parallel to this, and then we can bring it back into our, our domestic organizing. And so we use uh, first the special rapporteurs um, that Rob was mentioning. Uh, they have a little bit more flexibility um, in how they interpret uh, international law. They can start to kind of get that language into, um, into some international documents. And then when we go to the treaty bodies, which are a little bit more formal, uh, we've got a basis to say, look, you're not making up something new. Uh, the top international expert on the right to housing has already said this is cruel and unusual punishment or cruel and human and degrading treatment. So just echo that there. Um, they've already said that it's a, a, a racially discriminatory issue. So for the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, just say it's a, you know, it, it's a, uh, has racially discriminatory impact. Um, so uh, we use that to get it into the treaty bodies. Um, and then from the treaty bodies, we then went to the Universal Periodic Review, which is a more political process um, where other countries around the globe are reviewing uh, the, their peer countries um, uh, on the international stage. And so we could then say to them, again, you know, this is not something that we're making up. This is actually something that's already been discussed by the treaty bodies. The U.S. has already been critiqued on this basis. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not as much of a stretch. You're not going to be hitting them with something that they're not expecting. And in fact, the U.S. government, um, because of the work that we did through the treaty reviews, through the uh, special rapporteur visits, uh, they had already actually said themselves that uh, criminalization of uh, homelessness may be a violation of our international human rights obligations. Uh, the first time that the U.S. government has actually acknowledged in a domestic uh, setting that a domestic practice could be a international human rights violation. And so uh, it was kind of just this back and forth between the international and, and the domestic, using those special rapporteur visits, as Rob said, to meet not just with people in the community, but to bring government representatives to hear uh, from the people that they are experiencing these rights violations and to hear about them in the context of a rights violation. Um, going to the treaty bodies and bringing those standards back into conversations with the U.S. government and saying, you know, this isn't just something that's going to stay on paper in Geneva. This is something you need to be implementing. What are you doing to make sure these recommendations get put into practice? And so all, you know, we just kept generating those international standards, bringing them back. And we got the federal government to create uh, federal grant incentives to decriminalize homelessness. We got the Department of Justice to include uh, uh, investigations into criminalization of homelessness and their civil rights uh, uh, investigations. We got the Department of Justice to file a brief on behalf of people experiencing homelessness, uh, saying that, in fact, it is cruel and human or cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment. And then that helped to generate an actual court decision um, that's now the law of the land in the Ninth Circuit, persuasive elsewhere, that is literally saving people's lives, is uh, protecting their rights to sleep and shelter themselves um, without harassment uh, in, in the Ninth Circuit and beyond. And so we, we have actually succeeded in taking those international standards and making them meaningful in the enjoyment of human rights for individuals in the U.S., and that's, you know, that's the end goal. Mahalo, thank you so much. And Rob, I admire many aspects of your advocacy, but one of them that really always strikes me is your dedication to mentorship, to build the movement. And can you share a bit about your vision for the future of the right and why it's so important to engage with youth and participate the way you have to actualize these articles? So thank you, Josh. I always feel that the work that I'm doing, that Eric's doing, and others involved in this work um, may not garner the results that we want to see in our lifetime, but we need to create a set of tools and a process that we could leave behind and say, continue from this point and move forward. 
So it's been a mission of mine um, to bring more people into this work. And Eric knows, as somebody I've worked with for years, I always talk about human rights, the circle, and how we need to widen that circle, right? We need to bring more people into understanding it. And, it, you know, in the beginning, I thought it was a challenge, but I've seen a shift over the last few years. More and more people talking about it. It moved from a slogan to a reality to people understanding, people wanting more education, more people willing to put themselves on the line and travel to Geneva and, and travel into courtrooms here in the U.S. and challenge judges. So I think that's all part of the process. But, you know, I am I feel blessed that I've had mentorship from people like Eric, from many others. I, I can go on with a list of the group that escorted me, including yourself, to the Universal Periodic Review in 20, 2010 in Geneva. Um, that was an incredible experience for me. And it was empowering. And it said, your voice matters. And people respect your voice. I, I'll never forget the folks in the room saying to me, there's a delegate from a specific country. Go tell him about homelessness in the U.S. You lived it. Share it with that person so that when it's their turn to question their peer, they can put pressure on their peer country. So I think it's imperative that we create this toolbox, as I like to call it, but also learning tools for people to continue to work because um, we may not actualize everything that we want to see um, before I'm no longer doing this work. It's true. It's quite a transformative toolkit. And Eric definitely has a lot of the tools. And so if you really utilize those using all the different ways, Eric, could you share a bit on your vision for the future? Because, you know, you can see the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights coming up with general comments that expand on the elements. What is your idea of how you see us moving in our final moment? Uh, really, I see it becoming a domestic practice. I see uh, domestic advocates uh, grappling more with what does it mean for the right to housing to be real in the U.S. Um, I see lawyers doing it. I see grassroots advocates doing it. I see people living on the street doing it. And, and that's really um, how, we, how we operationalize it, how we, how we make it a reality for everybody. I really want to thank you both and just touching on all the transformative work that we're doing, the toolkits that it takes, and really Article 25 demands a progressive realization based on the resources of each state and the well-being of each citizen's new measurement for what matters most for a meaningful life. Food, clothing, housing, health care are absolutely crucial for a standard of living rooted in social justice. Thank you so much for all that you both do. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.